Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kirsten Benetti, a board member for Exposomics and Children's Environmental Health at Mount Sinai. I'm delighted to welcome you for today's lunchtime chat in our environment and health series. This series is designed to be relevant to families, to our daily lives, and empower individuals with new information coming out of the latest research happening at Mount Sinai. Today, we will hear from Dr. Scott Sisher, a leading pediatric allergist and researcher at Mount Sinai, who will talk to us about food allergies, a growing concern for so many families today. We are making incredible strides in understanding how complex environmental factors around us, from the air we breathe, to the food we eat, to the chemicals in products we buy, how all of these factors collectively shape our health trajectory. We are learning that the timing of exposures is also incredibly consequential, especially during critical developmental stages. Most importantly, we are making inroads to understand how we can counteract harmful exposures and protect our health. If you weren't able to tune in last week, I'd encourage you to check out Dr. Robert Wright's talk, which focus on how we were able to understand our environment in really amazing new ways, not conceivable 10 years ago, truly opening the door to new models of prevention and care. Today's presentation will be about 25 minutes, followed by 20 minutes for questions. Please use the Q&A function, and we will try to get to as many answers as possible. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott Sisher, Division Chief of Allergy and Immunology in the Department of Pediatrics and Director of the Elliott and Rosalind Jaffe Food Allergy Institute here at Mount Sinai. Dr. Sisher is a clinician and a researcher, and he is a great resource to parents trying to understand food allergies in their children. And I understand he has a new book out that will interest parents on food allergies coming out in May which I hope to get a little preview of today. And with that, Dr. Sisher, please take the stage. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And so I'm really very excited to speak with everyone today. I wanna to thank Dr. Wright for, and the others at Exposomics for the uh, invitation. And of course, uh, Kirsten for the lovely introduction. The topic today is about food allergy. It's about preventing food allergy and I've, uh, titled it, it's more than what's on your fork, because you would probably think it probably has to do with exactly just what you're eating, um, but it's probably a lot more than that. So one of the troubling things about food allergy is that there seems to be a mini epidemic, or at least there, there had been one. Currently, we believe that up to 10% of children and 10% of adults have a food allergy. So some um, usually a, a allergic reaction means that the immune system is attacking the food in some way and resulting in symptoms like hot, like anaphylaxis or hives or trouble breathing are common ones that people know about. So it's pretty common and it can be severe. Having said that, about two to three times the number of people um, will say that they have a food allergy when really fewer do, because it can be confusing about what's a food allergy or not. So for example, lactose intolerance is very common. Having uh, stomach uh, problems, gas from the sugar in milk that causes this discomfort, but it's not really an allergy because it's not an immune response. So there's a lot of semantics involved. True food allergy is more common in children than adults typically, and the foods that affect children are milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nut, fish, and shellfish. For adults, it's more about peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and then some fruits and vegetables, but usually with milder allergies. And ultimately, a person could be allergic to virtually any food, but the ones I just mentioned are the most common ones. Now, the CDC reported that from 97 to 2007, there was a 50% increase in food allergy. We had done a study from 1997 through 2008 across the United States looking for the prevalence of peanut allergy in children. And when I first did this study in 1997, it was one in 250 children with a peanut allergy. We repeated it with the same techniques of the study. And I was shocked 
by 2008 to see essentially a tripling in that number to one in 70 or over 1%. I did not believe my own study. And at the same time, around 2008, there were a few other studies that came out in different areas of the world. They were actually coming out with the same over 1% number for peanut allergy alone. And so I started to believe my own information and started to ask, well, you know, why are we seeing an increase? So this, uh, my sister treats me like Lucy uh, treats Linus and uh, the mental health expert says, sounds like you've got an allergy to peanuts. So I know right now I'm just focusing on peanut allergy, but the same story or questions can be asked about any food allergy. When we're thinking about what would make a person's immune response go haywire or wrong against a, a food that's supposed to be nourishment, we think about the different parts of the story. And one part of the story is genetics. There may be a specific genetic predisposition to peanut allergy. And in fact, we did studies on twins and found that there was a much higher rate of shared allergy of pe to peanut among identical twins, uh, which was 67%, compared to siblings or fraternal twins, where it was 7%. So it's not completely genetics, but it's heavily genetics. There may be just a general genetic predisposition to allergies in general, and then food becomes one of those things. We have many studies, and I'm going to go into this more deeply, that having eczema or atopic dermatitis is a risk factor for food allergy or peanut allergy. We believe that environmental exposures are going to be playing a role. There were some studies suggesting that use of antacids might play a role as a risk factor for food allergy, perhaps ingesting foods that are similar but not exactly the same. So for example, peanut is a type of bean and maybe other beans, eating other beans would be an issue. That actually does not turn out to be an issue. Topical exposure to things, um, not, not just maybe chemicals, but actually allergens such as foods themselves. Pollen proteins have similarities with some foods and could be a trigger or reason. There's also the issue of processing. So if you were to you know, just pick a peanut out of the field, it's much different than the type of peanut that we typically eat, which is roasted peanut, which is cooked at high temperature, it's caramelized, and that really changes a lot of the proteins. And then the timing, as Kirsten alluded to, the timing of eating the food, does it diff is it different if you're eating peanut at six months of age, at 12 months of age, at five years of age, and also how much you would eat? Is it, does it matter if you're having, having it periodically or more continuously? What about the mothers uh, passing the proteins on through breast milk or breast milk in general, or what the mother might be ingesting while she's pregnant? So these are all things that we thought of, but there are even bigger ones, like there's an obesity ec epidemic which changes the immune responses to things. There's so many chemicals are in our environment and urbanization. We're not living um, you know, in, in rural areas and farming societies, which have very different exposures. So there's a lot going on with our, with our environment. And if there's an increase, a tripling of peanut allergy over a short period of time, there's really no easy way to blame genetics on that. It really has to be the environment. So I wanna take you back in history about 22 years. Um, when I was just a few years into being an allergist, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with prevention guidelines for food allergy. And they said, based on very little information, that if there was a family history of allergy, then the mother should consider avoiding peanuts and nuts during pregnancy and should breastfeed, and, and also during breastfeeding. And that a baby, get, now imagine this, that I was, as I read this, I was kind of in shock, a baby should avoid milk to age one, egg to age two, and peanut, tree nut, and fish to age three. Now that was based on some studies, but they weren't perfect studies by any means. And I was just looking at it thinking, well, gee, you could have a perfectly healthy baby whose you know, father has hay fever and asthma, and you would be saying, don't give this baby milk till age one, egg to age two, and that, that means no birthday cake. Uh, and no peanut tree or fish to age three. I mean, those some of those are a lot of healthy foods. So I, I immediately was questioning, you know, where did this advice come from, come from, and should we even be giving it? So as the years went by, between about 2000 and 2010, a number of studies came out that were actually against that advice. 
what was being found was that risk factors for peanut allergy, again, I'm focusing on that as a, as a target food because it is such a common and significant allergy, topical, topical exposures to creams that had peanut in it was a risk factor. And having eczema was a risk factor, but just about anything going into the mouth of a baby was not. So the baby eating peanut early on was not a risk factor. The mother eating peanuts while pregnant or while breastfeeding was not a risk factor. So that was sort of counter this idea of not eating it. So that led to a bunch of studies um, that tried to get at the idea of, well, does timing of eating it matter? Because for example, again, the 2000 recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics and actually similar recommendations in, in the UK, we're saying don't give babies peanut protein if they're, if they're trending toward allergy. And this study, which became you know, quite famous in the food allergy field, which we call the LEAP study, learning early about peanut, took babies who had high risk factors for peanut allergy, meaning that they had really bad eczema or egg allergy. They, they evaluated them at four to 11 months of age, and they did allergy testing of peanut. The allergy test was very strongly positive. They said, okay, you're not in the study. It looks like you're already allergic. But if the allergy test was negative or a little bit positive, they randomized them to avoid peanut as the general instructions had been, or to actually go ahead and eat peanut, which often had to be done initially under supervision to make sure they didn't get sick from it. But at the end of the day, as you see here, and uh, if someone could shout out to me, if you could see the pointer, um, but those, whether yes. they had, great. So whether they had a positive allergy test or not, overall, if they were given peanut early, they had overall an 80% reduction in peanut allergy. So it really proved that eating peanut early was a good thing. I'm going to get to why that might be, but it may, but at that point, um, I had already um, now gotten more into the field of allergy and the American Academy of Pediatrics went back, got involved with the American Academy of Pediatrics and ended up on a group that rescinded. So in 2008, I was on the group that rescinded the recommendations that I showed you before that were made in 2000. The recommendations we were left with at the time was, you know, don't alter the diet. But we didn't talk people into eating allergens early. We just said, you, don't, you shouldn't delay introdu introducing them. This study changed things again and it resulted in your tax dollars at work uh, a group was brought together by the government, the NIH, and evaluated the study I just showed you and other studies and came up with new recommendations about specifically adding peanut to the diet early. And the instructions were divided into three ways. One was the exact same group that I mentioned before that we were in the study, very high risk for peanut allergy, someone with severe eczema or egg allergy or both, they might get tested, but they would be getting infant safe forms of peanut into the diet at four to six months of age. And certainly maybe later questions on what that means, infant safe. Guidelines two and three were sort of for the rest of the population. If there was a little bit of sign of allergy, it was encouraging uh, people to get peanut in early. Um, and if there was no eczema or any food allergy or signs of issues, then it was considered, well, just do it what's appropriate for your family practices. But for most families in the US, there's peanut proteins around. So we are generally having people, even without any risk factors, just start it earlier, you know, typically in that, you know, six, eight, 10 month age range. So that was a lot of talking about peanut, but what about other foods? So this is where it, it starts to get a little bit more murky. I'm showing you here a study that um, looked at all of the studies available at the time about early introduction of egg in terms of whether it would be protective. And this study, by looking at multiple other studies, concluded that yes, having egg in the infant's diet early would be protective. But the way that studies like this are done is they, they look at multiple studies and sort of combine the information, but studies are often not so much the same. And what you'll see here um, is that this uh, these lines and boxes are showing where there's either a study showing a decreased risk of allergy or an increased risk of allergy to egg. And you can see that when the bars go over the middle, it's not so sure that they found a, a convincing result. So this study, this study, this study, which said it was a risk to give it early, and this study all were kind of like on the borderline. 
what brought this into a positive was one single study out of Japan. And if we look a little bit closer at that particular study, which is shown here, so each study had its own nuances. I'm not going to read through this, but there's slightly different age groups, slightly different forms of egg. But in this particular study that drew it into a positive result and saying, oh, you should feed it early because it'll protect the baby from egg allergy, this used a special heated egg powder that was given to high-risk infants. And then when it was time to see if it protected them, they were fed just more of that same powder. So never, no one ever actually tried to feed these babies scrambled eggs, for example, which is different than this special heated egg powder. So you know, I think there's a little bit of a question mark on this one. And there have been subsequent studies that add further question marks because in this study with nearly 10,000 people, age of introduction of egg uh, throughout Europe was not significant. Uh, as, a, as a risk factor for having egg allergy. But interestingly, eczema had the strongest risk factor for egg allergy, and I'll get back to that. And this is another study, a birth cohort of almost uh, 2,700 children, where again, they did find that peanut allergy was more common if they started peanut late, but egg and milk was not affected. And so maybe, you know, either you could argue, well, peanut is special in some way, or maybe for egg, you would have to start even earlier than six or four months. Then we come to milk. And there, there are several other studies uh, showing that timing of introduction of or early, trying to introduce milk early didn't make a difference. But there have been some nuances with studies, and I'm showing you those here in the study called SPADE, shown first in, the, in this table having small amounts of cow's milk formula daily between one and two months of age did protect against milk allergy. Avoidance of milk during the first three days of life had a protective effect, but then in studies where you tried to give milk early to babies, they didn't see a protective effect. So there seems to be a lot of nuances here about timing, amount, length of giving it, and, and, and similar. So it's, it's the, the story's not completely written yet. So I'm changing topics a bit. This, the conclusion from the previous one is that we have a lot of evidence for peanut, not as much for milk and egg. Uh, and, and in a few slides from now, I'm gonna summarize what we're telling people nowadays. But I wanna take a little bit of a, a, a side trail because babies aren't just eating peanut, they're not just eating egg. And so the totality of an infant's diet is also part of the story. And this is one of several studies that looked at diet diversity. There's a lot of different ways to define this. It could be based on you know, the types of foods, on, based on the numbers of foods, the families of the foods. But this study looked at several different measures of diet diversity. And what they found is that the number of foods, whether it's at six months or number of foods by 12 months, was related to the more different types of foods there were by six months or 12 months, the less likelihood there was of having any food allergy. So both, of, both whether looking at it um, by 12 months or six months, it was good to have many different types of food in the diet. Now, what about maternal diet? So I had mentioned earlier, a hypothesis might be, well, you know, some small amount of what the mother ingests is coming through into the breast milk. Um, this could be variable from person to person. And the, of course, the food has gone through digestion before it gets into the bloodstream and makes it, to, makes it into the uh, mother's milk. So multiple studies now have concluded that there's no evidence that a maternal exclusion diet during pregnancy or lactation affects the development of allergic disease in infants. And so that, again, you know, as the years went by, is against those early recommendations from, two, from the year 2000 that suggested that mothers might avoid these allergenic foods. What about um, breastfeeding versus formula? So there are a lot of reasons that breastfeeding beats out a formula feeding, um, but when we're talking about allergy, there's not specific evidence that one or the other affects food allergy per se. But there had been recommendations early on that specialized formulas, so-called hypoallergenic formulas, might be beneficial to prevent allergy. Multiple studies now have said that that is not the case. So all of the guidelines now are saying that these specialized formulas, the ones that might be given that have partially digested 
milk proteins in them or extensively digested milk proteins in them, even ones that could be given to babies with a milk allergy, that using those formulas for prevention does, doesn't end up helping for, for food allergy. So the 2008 guidelines I mentioned before were replaced by 2019 guidelines um, that, that I was again part of that we not only dispelled the early ideas of avoiding allergens, but came to a more comprehensive um, recommendation to encourage, in particular, the earlier introduction of peanut and not to treat any of the food allergens like something you need to delay in the diet. So the general approach now that I will be telling families, um, and to some extent, whether they have allergies or not in the family, not to delay common allergens, um, whole milk is not, a, you know, is meant for uh, baby cows, calves, not for baby humans. So if, if breastfeeding is not being done, then a uh, milk-based based formula could be used. But milk products like yogurts and, and things like that in the first year of life could certainly be added. Egg, peanuts, tree nuts, again, in infant-safe forms, meaning a peanut is a choking hazard, a, a butter, a nut butter is a choking hazard for, it, for an infant, but smoothed out or mixed into things or powder forms or you know, gr ground into something, um, that, would be, that would be more infant-safe. Um, include allergens with solids in, in those forms around six months, but not before four months. There's some controversy about should you exclusively breastfeed to six months or four months, and there's different approaches on that. Having a diverse diet, a healthy diet. Um, if there's severe eczema or other food allergy, we consider evaluations, but we try not to do too many tests because there are problems with over-testing. Many times a positive test will happen, but the person's not allergic. There's no protective benefit from the formulas I mentioned before, the hydrolyzed formulas. We don't have the mother exclude allergens and we do recommend exclusive breastfeeding for those first months, but we can't say that it's gonna prevent food allergy per se. So let me take a little bit of a deeper dive into the reason why the skin is coming up in our, in our talking here. So when you get food into the body through the mouth, it goes into the digestive tract, which has a specific way of handling proteins. It has to think a lot about, well, you know, here's some bacteria that I, you know, want to get rid of. Here's some bacteria that's healthy that I don't want to get rid of. And here's nourishing food proteins that my immune system will intelligently see, but doesn't want to attack. And a difference in a specific set of cells will do that. When you have eczema and the skin is open and inflamed and abraded and absorbs things easily, the types of immune responses are actually more along the lines of allergy types that make allergic antibodies that cause problems or make allergic immune responses that cause problems. So you could say there's some kind of race here where a baby with eczema, if they're getting the food early enough, then the immune system from the gut might take over and make it okay. But if they're getting it, if they're not getting it in their mouth and it's everywhere around them, then it's getting on their skin. So that would be a reason why the earlier introduction by mouth could be helpful. But it might also make you say, well, wait a minute, if I could make the eczema better, maybe that'll be helpful because if it's getting in through this bad skin barrier. So here's a demonstration of sort of two things going on at once. This is a study that we did um, with a cohort of children who are high risk for food allergy. And we looked at their home dust and we measured how much peanut was we could find in their dust at home. As the amount of peanut in the dust at home increased, the risk of peanut allergy increased. But for the ones who had atopic dermatitis, AD, it was even more increased. So kind of more proof that having it in the environment, maybe without eating, or especially if you have this eczema is a problem. So you might theorize, well, if we could improve the skin barrier, then we'll have less of a problem. There have been two trials so far that actually did not find that using emollients on the skin ended up protecting against food allergy. It, it helped some with the eczema, but didn't make, make the food allergies not happen. There are a number of trials, some are happening now and some are planned to look at this further because people really thought that this would do something. And so it's still being looked at. Now, our, I mentioned about a, a healthy diet and a diverse diet. Um, I guess we could discuss what is healthy, but one of the ways that a lot of food is made nowadays is to, I mentioned before, roasting peanut. And high heat um, and unhealthy fats together, like a barbecue, can cause a lot of potentially inflammatory chemicals to happen. 
These are sometimes called advanced, glyco advanced glycation end products. And there's immune studies showing that they could hype up sort of a, an adverse inflammatory response. This uh, paper that I'm showing you here is really like a theory paper. It's not a study with a lot of uh, data about a specific trial or something like that. But they, they do note that in diets that include more of these like barbecued meats um, and not enough fresh fruits and vegetables that there's more eczema, hay fever, asthma. Food allergy hasn't been looked at yet, but you would imagine that it could potentially also be part of that story. So what about other types of ways of changing the diet that aren't the food specifically? So looking at adding healthy fats to the diet might be a way of improving the, the equation and, and looking at that in pregnancy was an idea. Probiotics, in other words, healthy bacteria or ways to make more healthy bacteria might be another way. There are, actually aren't studies that had looked at just giving it to pregnant women, but they also were giving it to the infants um, for a few months afterwards. So they, one, some studies did find reduced um, allergy testing that was positive to egg and peanut, but no impact on final outcomes of egg or peanut allergy for um, supplementation with healthier fats. And although using probiotics reduced some eczema, again, it didn't really impact the food allergy. Vitamin D has also been looked at. It was noticed that there's more allergy and more autoimmune disease as you go further away from the equator with less light. And if there's less light exposure, there could be less vitamin D production in your own body. And you know we do see vitamin D deficient pretty commonly. So far, there's one study that uh, should have results soon that's looking at vitamin D supplementation. There's a to see if it would reduce the risk of food allergy. So far, there is mixed evidence from epidemiologic studies about whether uh, this would be, be the case. But having a clinical trial will be helpful to figure that out. So some more insights on the risk factors, and this is gonna build a story about the germs in our environment, the microbiome. So even, so I mentioned before that you could have a positive allergy test to a food, but be able to eat it anyway. Um, that's its own lecture, um, but there is this issue where if you just test everybody, you'll see a lot of people with a positive test and only a very small number with those, with those positive tests actually react. If the test is negative, they're usually okay with the food. So that's the way the test works. So when you're looking at many different countries, um, they have high rates of positive allergy tests, but very low rates of food allergy. So that means that there's something different where this translation of the immune system seeing the, the protein is not translating to allergy. And this is a study out of um, Singapore seeing that they often give their babies things like egg and peanut and shellfish very late, and yet there's not a lot of allergy to these foods. And the risk factors are, is not the timing, but it was having eczema and a family history. So here, all of this stuff I showed you before about the United States and Europe is not panning out for Singapore. And then as we look at here, a study from Australia, um, you know, what are the risk factors for food allergy in adolescents? Eczema still pops out as a major factor, but there's, there's a protective factor here and dog exposure is, that, is a protective factor. And then in this uh, study also um, from Europe, again, looking at food allergy, owning a dog in early childhood is protective for the allergy. So, you know, maybe we're not living on farms where there's, you know, a lot of uh, exposure to, to germs and dogs are a way of having that natural germ exposure come into the home. We've been doing studies looking at the microbiome. There's, this is a, its own lecture as well, but there's, there's, you know, typically more bacteria that make up our body than our own cells. And we have found both for milk and egg allergy that the relationships of communities of bacteria related to outcomes or um, occurrence of allergies such as those to milk or eggs. So there's something that could be different about the communities of bacteria and, and the immune responses to the foods resulting in or protecting from food allergy. Here's a recent study that um, looked at pacifier use, and there, there was a previous study that gave a hint to the same conclusion. When families used an antiseptic on their pacifier, there was more food allergy than if they cleaned the pacifier in other ways. So really getting rid of the bacteria was a risk factor. 
and it makes me ask the question, what are normal feeding practices? And normal is defined by what we want to define normal as. I mean, I have pictures here of, of breastfeeding. That would be, you know, pretty normal. You're weaning to solid foods, but, you know, in, in our culture, a lot of those solid foods come in jars, which means they were processed in some way. And how would babies eat if it wasn't for the companies that make baby foods or baby cereals? Um, how would they, how would babies eat something that was hard to chew? Um, you know, we puree the foods for the babies and obviously babies couldn't eat nuts if, you know, that would be a choking hazard. So, you know, without companies, there would be no nuts for babies, I guess, until they were old enough to chew them safely. And the weaning foods are different in different countries, but a lot of the weaning foods are foods that we think of as common allergens like fish or eggs or milk that could come in really early in the diet in many countries that don't have a lot of allergy. So I'm asking them what are normal feeding practices? Well, um, a strange similar question is why do we kiss? So, you know, one theory of why we might kiss, well, okay, that's a sign of love. What else is a sign of love? Eating could be considered like a sign of love. And there is this thing where uh, pre-masticating, chewing a food yourself, and then spitting that food into a baby. I mean, you've seen pictures of baby birds, and uh, I'm showing here uh, other um, pr primates also may feed babies mouth to mouth. And that's potentially a way that you can get choking hazard food to a baby or anything that the family is eating to a baby without a company turning it into a puree. And pre-mastication of food is actually a cultural thing as well. And it's not that unusual um, to find out that although it may not be talked about much, it's fairly common, including in communities around here. Um, and we're, so we're looking at, although there's differences from place of birth and differences into whether the mother of the mother of the baby also pre-masticated the baby's mother, um, pre-masticated food for the baby's mother, overall, one in five were chewing baby food to, to give to the baby. And this is from a, a number of years ago, but Alicia Silverstone from Clueless um, was caught on Fox News saying he literally craw crawls across the room to attack my mouth if I'm eating and she's giving her, her baby food out of her mouth. And Fox News asked medical and nutritional experts what they thought of, feeding, of that feeding for humans. And they said, it doesn't seem like a hygienic uh, practice. So I think that doctor was probably saying it in a, in a negative way, not hygienic, but I guess I would argue, well, gee, that's a way that the baby would be getting the food that the society eats, would be getting germs that the society sees, um, and it would be a diverse and potentially healthy diet. So I'm not saying everyone should start doing that, but just making some uh, food for thought, as they say. So as I end here, I wanna tell you about a few studies that we're doing. This study, which is uh, NIH sponsored, um, we asked the question, it turns out that there are studies where vaginal delivery is a risk factor for having allergy and food allergy. And the reason we thought was that babies who come through the vaginal canal get all sorts of bacteria from the mother, but the babies who are coming out by C-section are doing that in a very sterile type of environment and are not getting that burst of bacteria to begin life with. So what would happen if you seeded them with the, with the, um, with the bacteria from the mother's vaginal canal. That's what we're looking at in this study. We also have a birth cohort study, um, also for uh, individuals who are giving birth at Mount Sinai, uh, where we're trying to learn more about the various risk factors from the environment, from um, you know, uh, genetics, and, and all sorts of ways that people may have uh, outcomes of food allergy and eczema. We also have a study starting where we're testing a specific mix of bacteria that based on various studies could be healthy types of bacteria that might prevent allergy, food allergy. And so we're currently enrolling babies from one to 12 months of age. And after uh, we get a group of those, we'll be going down to uh, newborns under one month of age. We have a very busy clinical team doing all of these studies and seeing our patients. Um, and I, I wanted to just give you some insights on the Jaffe Food Allergy Institute. Um, I consider us the most trusted name in food allergy since establishment in 1997 with strong funding from NIH, patients uh, cared for. Uh, we have a huge uh, number of trainees who've gone on to run programs all over the country and world um, and high impact on research advances. And our team is bigger than the clinical team I showed you before because we have a, a huge amount of research going on 
uh, in the laboratories and we're looking at psychosocial issues with food allergy and chronic inflammation with food allergy and, and um, disparity issues and epidemiology and just about anything that you could think of. Um, but we do have more to do in the field of exposomics. Um, to learn more about our studies, you can email us at foodallergyresearch at mssm.edu to get on our email list. You can also search us on Facebook. We do monthly parent groups, thanks to our parent advisory board. Um, and uh, we, we just did, uh, did one about nutrition and there'll be others coming up. So check Facebook for that. So with that, I thank you and open up the questions. Thank you so much, doctor. That was an excellent and very informative presentation. And now let's get to some questions. So first, you mentioned that food allergies are more common in children than adults. Is that because you're seeing increased allergies over time in kids or because adults are actually overcoming these allergies as they age? So the answer is both. And then also that my statement is not necessarily true to begin with. Um, so, so the classical thing is that young children are more prone to allergies to milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nut, fish, and shellfish. The milk, egg, wheat, soy part, they typically outgrow. So when they come into adulthood, if they're not outgrowing the peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish, that's what they're kind of left with. So that's where we've typically seen higher rates of food allergy in the children, presumably by the time they get to adulthood, or also with the overall epidemiology of food allergy having changed over the years, you see less in adults. But as we're starting to look at studies more recently, the percentages in adults have also moved up from what they used to be quoted as, which was 5% at best, to now 10%. And so it's kind of matching what's in the children. And there is new onset of some of the childhood ones in adults, but that's not as common. Um, but there's also new onset of various of the other allergens I already mentioned. So it's there's a lot going on with that and persistence even seems to be a little bit stronger than it was when we were looking at this decades ago, meaning fewer people are outgrowing their milk or egg allergy, for example. Thank you so much. Another question has come in about vitamin D supplements in babies. Is it safe for babies to take vitamin D supplementation? Um, I'm not going to give an answer to that because I think you should talk to your pediatrician, but um, there, uh, yes, I will leave it at that. In terms, we do check vitamin D um, frequently in our food allergy clinic, um, but as I mentioned before, there are reasons to be vitamin D sufficient, but you don't wanna be overdosed with vitamin D either, because that could also be a problem. So definitely talk to your pediatrician about it. Okay, wonderful. Next question. I know you mentioned the study on bacterial mixes, I assume giving them to babies, and I assume that's in the form of a probiotic. So do you recommend giving kefir or a probiotic to a baby or a toddler to prevent allergies? Right. Well, um, the first part could be a yes. And the second part would be uh, probably it doesn't. Um, so let me rephrase the question as two. Um, if a family says to me, hey, you know, we would like to use these, you know, whatever the, you know, name your probiotic, my answer would be, I don't have a reason to tell you not to. Um, and certainly go ahead. I mean, I don't think there's anything specifically dangerous about it. But if it's to prevent food allergy, then I would say that, you know, the data so far is, is mixed on that. And there's no real evidence that it's going to help. And part of the problem there is that, you know, there have been multiple studies. And although the, you know, general evidence has been, oh, it didn't, it didn't prevent anything. The, the problem has been that it hasn't been looked at typically as communities of bacteria. It's like, here's this one bacteria or here's a random number of bacteria, but it probably matters what the bacteria are. It's not just that they're bacteria. So, you know, the, the studies that we, we did that I showed you and the study that um, is an intervention study that's coming up are looking at it not like, oh, there's one missing thing or there's one too much of something. It's, it's really communities of bacteria. And the, and, and the reason that the bacteria have even anything to do with it is because they, um, they're gonna interact with the foods that we eat, they're gonna interact with the immune system, and there's a lot of different me metabolic things that happen. Uh, so, so it's a very complex ecosystem going on there and, and the changes in balance. So what I didn't show you was, you know, people who grow up on farms, I kind of implied this, but people who grow up on farms, 
you know, have less allergy problems. And even in areas that become urbanized, and this has happened in many areas in China where, you know, the rates of allergy and food allergy were very low, but then they industrialized and suddenly they, you know, blossomed into the numbers that we see here. Um, you know, it, it all had to do with sort of this change in, in all of the environmental things, this way of living. Great, having, dish, having dishwashers, so there's a study showing even having dishwashers. So, you know, if you, in, in the old days, you would wash your dishes in the sink and you probably didn't do as good a job. And, and for, so families that had, so there's a study saying families that have dishwashers have, you know, it's just a cleaner environment again. And do you also think that farming practices or food production or eating organic versus non-organic may contribute or to a food allergy or the prevention of a food allergy. Yeah, so um, so the the last twist that you put on it, it makes a big difference. I don't think that, um, you know, the process, it's, not, it, it's about, there's two different things. There's prevention and then you're already allergic to it. If you're already allergic to it, then it, it the food is the food and there are nuances to talk to your allergist about because yes, um, there, you know, there are people who could tolerate less of something or a different process of something. Uh, you know, so there's someone, you know, maybe who could, who could tolerate egg that when it's baked into a cookie, but not tolerate egg when it's scrambled, you know, cause it's, it's cooked differently. But really, I think what the question was about is, is the prevention aspect of it and the, and the processing. So, so processed food in general, and I showed you baby food jars, and I always make a joke that my breakfast each day, which I'll show you, um, I, won't, I won't show you a brand name, but I'll show you it's, it's something that will never go bad, right? So there's no bacteria in here. So, you know, if I were smarter and having, you know, fruit for breakfast, which I also may do, um, you know, then I'm getting some natural dirt from the environment. But if I'm eating that package thing, I'm getting nothing. And, um, and you know, eating a finger food, you know, you get something off your fingers. So, so, so yes, like not being in a, a healthy, you know, in a farm environment, you're kind of forced to have all that bacteria having a dog in the house, you're sort of getting licked and you're getting some stuff from the outside in there. And so there are all these uh, examples. You mentioned organic. Um, in terms of chemicals, that would be a difference, which I'm not an expert on. Um, but in terms of the protein that's in the food, that doesn't really matter organic grown or not organic grown because the protein is the protein. Great, wonderful, thank you so much. The next question is, how do you know or when would you suspect a baby has a food allergy? So what are the signs to look out for? That's a fantastic question. Um, so, so thank you for that because I didn't get to do like background. Um, so I, I mentioned in the, sort of in the beginning is very briefly that a typical food allergy that we think of is sort of an immediate reaction after eating the food with some classic symptoms. And so, you know, the Typical foods I already mentioned, the classic symptoms would be skin symptoms like hives, which look like mosquito bites, or flares of rashes, um, like redness of the skin that happens quickly and that generally goes away, you know, in over an hour or something like that. Then stomach issues, so like stomach pain, vomiting, uh, maybe later diarrhea, um, breathing issues, so wheezing, coughing, swelling of the airway can happen in a in a serious reaction. It could also include circulation. So there could be loss of consciousness and such. And anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction that comes on quickly and, and could be fatal. Um, so this is all very serious. There are also um, cr uh, chronic symptoms from allergy, such as chronic stomach problems, but that would take a gastroenterologist to look in and see if there's allergic inflammation in the gut, for example, but there's some clues um, if that's going on. Chronic eczema, um, that's a tricky one because atopic dermatitis or, or eczema is a skin disease. And so you can certainly have that without food allergy. There are some people that might get itchier with a particular food, but usually even if you start to remove the foods from the diet, the eczema doesn't like magically go away. So nowadays we're not trying to remove a lot of food from the diet for eczema, but if there's a super high suspicion, we'll look into it. Um, and so for a baby, which was the original question, um, having hives around the mouth, swellings, um, those uh, and flares of rashes are the most common uh, things. But if there's vomiting and diarrhea, we also worry. Great, that's very, very helpful. One more question. The title of your upcoming book, The Complete Guide to Food Allergies in Adults and Children seems pretty straightforward. Could you tell us a bit about it and who it's written for? 
Um, it is written for families um, who have or living with or care for people with food allergies. So that could include, you know, teachers and you know anyone who has to has to manage food allergy. Um, it's got over. It's in a question answer format with over a thousand. I think it was around twelve hundred questions, and it incorporates all of the newest stuff. Like I don't have. I guess time today to talk about all the treatments that we're looking at for food allergy. And there are, there's now an FDA approved therapy and there's a whole bunch of things in the pipeline. Um, there's a lot of new information about what to do about food allergies and how to manage it, about the treatments that are used for an allergic reaction. And of course, all of these prevention things, which are new. And I did, I think I covered most of those today. So you could maybe read quickly through that chapter, but, but yes, that's, that's, the, that's the goals of the book. Thank you for asking. Great, and when is that book coming out? Um, I believe next month. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Sisher. And maybe we can have you on again to talk about the treatment side of things. <laughs> well, Kirsten, thank you again. And thank you uh, for the invitation as well. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you could, please send us your feedback by taking a photo of this QR code to complete the evaluation, evaluation survey. We will also send it to you by email for those who have registered. I hope that you will join us next Wednesday for a talk by Dr. Manish Arora, who will update us on his autism related research and opportunities for early intervention. Thank you so very much for joining us today during your lunchtime and have a wonderful day. <laughs>